Hi everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about high dynamic range imaging, also referred to as HDR imaging. And I think the best way to get started with this is to just take a look at the simple example below. Uh, here we have uh, two photos of a young boy. Uh, this uh, photo below on the left was uh, taken with an iPhone in standard camera mode. And in that case, the metering system on the camera attempts to uh, determine what the main subject matter of the photo is, in this case the young boy, and then it tries to set the exposure accordingly. So it's done a nice job here. The boy is uh, properly exposed, um, yet the uh, background, the sky, uh, and the clouds are completely washed out. And then sometimes the opposite occurs. Sometimes you'll get a, a background that's properly exposed, yet the, uh, the foreground is just far too dark. And the reason this occurs is because the actual intensities in the real world scene far exceed the capability of the camera to record those values. Uh, since most cameras only have an 8 bit per channel uh, capability, there just aren't enough bits to capture the full dynamic range of the scene. So in contrast to that, uh, we have the image to the right. Uh, this image was also taken with an iPhone in uh, HDR mode. And in this case, uh, both the uh, foreground and the background are all properly exposed and the photo looks uh, fantastic. So uh, how exactly is this done? Well, what the iPhone does is it takes um, three photographs at different exposures uh, and it takes them in quick succession so that there's no movement uh, or almost no movement in between the, the three shots. And then it takes those uh, three, what we call um, low dynamic range photos and merges them to come up with a HDR photo like the one shown here. So that's the basic idea and we'll talk about this in a little more detail uh, down here below with a different example. So this is a common uh, photo sequence of the old courthouse in St. Louis that's used to describe HDR imaging. You can see that there's uh, four different images here taken at different exposures. Uh, the image to the far left uh, underexposed quite a bit, although that there is some um, area here in the lower portion of the building that looks properly exposed and might contain some useful detail. And then further to the right here, uh, there's a little bit more of the building that's properly exposed. Uh, still the center is nice too, and then these other areas here uh, might uh, provide useful information. And then even further to the right here, now the buildings in the background start to have proper exposure. And then finally to the right, uh, the well-lit portion here in the center is completely blown out, but uh, perhaps the, um, the background buildings and even the sky, for example, and then some of these areas in the foreground uh, might contain useful information. So the hope is that uh, collectively, this uh, sequence of four images across all pixels in the image will contain some useful information that can be merged together to form a single HDR image. Uh, with proper exposure for all of the pixels. So let's take a look at some of the code that implements uh, this example. Uh, down here we're just importing some required modules and then uh, right here we're defining a convenience function that's going to read the images and the exposure times for each image. Uh, so in here we're just listing the file names of the four images and uh, right down here we're um, setting the exposure times for each of those images. We know what that is for this example, but you could also extract that information from the metadata in each image and do that programmatically. And then uh, finally down here in this for loop, we're just reading each of the uh, uh, images in and converting them to RGB and then returning the list of images and the exposure times. So the next uh, step in the process, uh, once we've read in the images, is to make sure they're properly aligned. And uh, even though these images may have been taken in quick succession or even on a tripod in quick succession, it's important that they be very accurately aligned um, down to the pixel level or even the subpixel level. So just as an example, the image here to the left is an HDR image that was produced without alignment. And you can see that the zoomed in section here at the top of the building has several ghosting artifacts and just doesn't look uh, quite right and is not a uh, true representation of that portion of the image. Uh, now contrast that with the uh, HDR image produced on the right. Uh, this was produced with alignment and you can see that the top portion of the building looks much more uh, correct. However, since the images that are used in this sequence are taken at different exposures, they actually look different and therefore standard alignment techniques just don't work. However, there is a special class in OpenCV that uses bitmaps uh, for this purpose and uh, that class is called CreateAlignMTB for Median Threshold Bitmap. 
Uh, so down here we're going to create an align MTB object and then use that object to call the process method from that class and pass at the list of images and then get back the list of aligned images right here. So uh, once we've done the alignment of the uh, images, uh, the next step in the process is to compute the camera response function. And the reason we need to do this is because most cameras we use are not linear, which means, for example, that if the radiance in a scene is doubled, the pixel intensity is recorded by the camera will not necessarily double. And this presents a problem when we want to merge images taken at different exposures. So for example, suppose the uh, response function was linear, then the intensities of the input images could be simply scaled by their exposure times, which would put them on the same radiance scale, and then we could simply compute an average intensity at every pixel location across those images to synthesize an HDR image. However, since the response function is not linear, we need to estimate it so that we can first linearize the images before combining them. However, since the response function for various cameras are considered proprietary information by the camera manufacturers, we need to actually use the images captured by the camera itself to estimate the response function. And this is actually a rather involved optimization problem, but fortunately OpenCV has two different classes that we can use for this purpose, uh, both named after the people that invented the algorithms. So let's take a look at the uh, code uh, in OpenCV that accomplishes this. Uh, the one we're going to be uh, focusing on is Create, Calibrate, Debevic. Uh, there's another one uh, by Robertson. In either case, uh, there's a class for each uh, algorithm. And here we're creating a uh, Calibrate, Debevic object. And then we're using that object to call the process method for that class. And we pass in the list of images and the uh, associated exposure times for those images. And we get back the inverse camera response function here. And so this next block of code here is simply plotting the camera response function. And you can see at the uh, lower intensity values, the function is quite linear uh, in this region here, and then starts to become nonlinear uh, right about here. And then finally, at the higher end of the spectrum, we start to see some clipping uh, at 255 as the uh, intensities in the actual scene exceed the recording limits of the camera. Also notice that the uh, three channels are calibrated separately since uh, the sensitivities are slightly different between them. And so now we can use this function to linearize the input images by mapping the measured pixel intensity in those images to the calibrated intensity so that the images can then be merged appropriately. So in this next section here, we use a separate class for that purpose. Uh, here we're calling the create merge debevic class to create an object, and then using that object to call the process method in that class pass in at the list of images, the exposure times for each of the images, and then the uh, response function that we uh, calculated up above. And that method then returns the HDR image that we've been looking for. So at this point, it's worth mentioning that the merging process intentionally ignores pixel values close to zero or 255. And the reason for that is that pixel values close to those extremes contain no useful information. So it's common to apply a hat type weighting function to each of the input images to filter out those pixels uh, from the merging process. So just to briefly summarize, because uh, there are multiple images of the scene at different exposure settings, the hope is that for every pixel we have at least one image that contains an intensity that is neither too dark nor too bright. However, there is one problem that still remains, which is the intensity values are no longer in the 0 to 255 range. Of course, black is completely zero, but HDR images can record light intensities from zero to essentially infinite brightness. So because they have a fixed range, they need to be stored as 32-bit floating point numbers. And since our displays require 8-bit images, we need one last step to bring the image intensities back down to the zero to 255 range. So that brings us to the final step in the process, which is called tone mapping, which refers to the process of mapping HDR images to 8-bit per channel images. So there's several uh, algorithms implemented in OpenCV for this purpose, uh, mostly designed to preserve as much detail as possible from the original image uh, while converting it to 8 bits per channel. Uh, but the main thing to keep in mind is that there's no correct way to perform tone mapping. Uh, sometimes the goal of tone mapping is to uh, achieve an aesthetically pleasing image that isn't necessarily realistic. Uh, however, the algorithms implemented in OpenCV tend to be fairly realistic, um, yet they have some differences and also uh, various parameters that are configurable uh, for each of the algorithms. So in this first example, we're going to take a look at using Drago's method uh, to create a tone map. 
and we start by uh, calling the create tone map Drago class and uh, to create an object and then use that object to call the process method for that class and we simply pass it the HDR image itself and that returns the uh, 8 bit per channel color image uh, shown below here. Uh, it does a very nice job of properly exposing uh, all regions of the uh, scene there. Uh, it's very uh, pleasing in my opinion and uh, even the background, uh, the buildings there seem to be properly exposed. So very nice result. Uh, and then moving on to the next example, this one is using uh, Reinhardt's method. And uh, it also looks very nice, uh, perhaps not as uh, aesthetically pleasing, but uh, certainly very realistic and with everything uh, properly exposed. And then finally, there's one more example down here that's uh, almost a combination of the two, I'd say. A little bit of the glowing here in, in the center, like the first image. And again, everything uh, looking fairly realistic and, and properly exposed. So that's a summary of the uh, HDR imaging uh, process. Uh, we covered a lot of detail, but when you step back and, and look at how much code was required, it wasn't very much. So that's all we really wanted to cover in this video, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.